So it all started with an interview with film director Therese Schechter about her new documentary film. Nobody doesn't want kids. People cannot want kids. It's a thing. That is not a thing. Well, it's my thing. Therese decided a long time ago she wouldn't have any children and as she puts it, it was just never on her list. I've known since high school that I did not want to be a mother. At one point you just declared that if I ever want to have grandchildren, don't look at me. This interview happened right after, after political revealed the Supreme Court was planning or thinking of overturning Roe versus Wade. So you recently released this movie which is called My So-Called Selfish Life. Uh, that explores the culture of pronatalism, which describes this world as being a place where uh, having babies is the norm, but that uses many, many ways to make you think that it's your own choice as a woman. Uh, is that how you would describe pronatalism? Of my whole life, I had never heard of pronatalism. Therese's approach is, we live in a world where we expect from people that they would at some point make babies. I think that um, it is a system like patriarchy is a system or nationalism is a system um capitalism <laughs> you know it's a system and and the thing with these systems is that they're so embedded in our culture that we don't notice they even exist it's like fish in water you know does the fish know it's in water what does it mean to live in a world where motherhood is our destiny and what happens if we say no <laughs> And more specifically, we live in a world where women uh, are said to attain their greatest value while they become mothers. So this level of just business as usual um, makes, it, makes it very challenging sometimes to talk about. There is a belief, a generalized belief, that they are accomplishing a form of bio biological fate while becoming mothers. The suggestion, the pressure, the forcing of having children. And generally it is serving um, larger forces in our society. Although because it's such a part of our society, we, we all believe that this is the right thing and the best thing and the most important thing until we maybe sit down and think about it a little bit, which is what I hope the film helps people do. In the film, Therese brings together the voices of those women who try to choose and sometimes refuse motherhood for themselves, by themselves, regardless of what is expected from them. This is by design. It's like, I'm not missing anything. I didn't forget to have kids. I'm just not interested. For example, in the movie, Therese dismantles a very famous myth. What I'd like to know is, did you have any surprise in the making of the movie? Did you, because I think you started thinking about it years ago. Um, did you have any surprise in the process? I mean, a lot of the surprises for me were things like things I just took for granted as real that were not. <laughs> the biological clock, for example, which is this thing that we all grow up with, like your, my biological clock is going to go off. Remember, your biological clock is ticking. I got to have a baby. I got to have a baby. I got to have a baby. You know, sort of just discovering that it was written by um, some journalist in the 70s based on no, no scientific evidence whatsoever. Um, actually, not even based on a real person, because he, at the beginning of the article, says there is a composite woman <laughs> that he has put together based on all these different women he knows who, who all ha have baby fever and you know, and, and he describes her as young and attractive, and maybe there's a man in her life and maybe there isn't. It's like all this like crazy condescending language. Um, and that is where we get this idea that there's like a time bomb in our bodies <laughs> that is gonna go off. There's no science behind it. Do you have a biological clock? Not ticking within me. Um, so I, the answer would have to be no. There's no biological reason for that to happen. There's fertility, right? You you at some point can are no longer fertile. But uh, as as some very smart people say in the film, the 
the idea of the biological clock is social. It's what's happening around you and the messages you're getting around you and what your friends are doing and what your family is saying. And it's a lot of um, social kind of psychology that might make you feel like I must have a baby right now, but it's, there's nothing in your body that's actually doing that. There's also a powerful moment in the movie that I really, really like. Lauren, one of the women we follow, is trying to get a sterilization, but over and over again she encounters the same, the very same answer. In five years from now, you might regret it. I am able to go and fly to China tomorrow and move there. I'm able to join the military. I'm able to sign a contract for a massive loan. I'm able to make so many decisions that I could regret as an adult. Why is it that someone is looking over me paternalistically in this area when in other areas of my life I'm respected as an adult? Through the process of the movie, Therese started to understand that the biological clock or the resistance um, Lauren is encountering is a symptom or two symptoms of a wider issue. I think the other thing was really fully understanding pronatalism as this very large system, because I thought about it in the way of like, oh, you know, your family kind of says, well, when are you going to have a kid? Or when, when are you going to give us grandchildren? That kind of stuff. Um, or, you know, just getting, um, getting money from the government every time you have a child, um, which I grew up in Canada, which was standard. And I know in France also, that's a big part of sure. um, government support. And I thought, oh, that's pronatalism. That's like you get money to, to help you when you have a child, you know. And um, it, it just got, it got bigger and bigger. Like, no, this isn't just your, the, what the family is saying to you. This is what we see in commercials and on TV shows and movies. And then this is how we talk about the right people having children and the wrong people having children. Nations need childbirth. Babies are good for the economy. Just seeing that sort of expand before my eyes was also quite surprising, but you know, makes for a much more interesting film, so. You could list any number of honors and degrees and somebody will still think that you're not fully accomplished if you haven't had a child. Not only does this involve pain for women who don't want to be mothers. To have somebody tell you you don't know what's best for you is extremely condescending and insulting. But also for women who can't be mothers. And also we might, like women might make decisions they are not fully happy with and become mothers when actually they don't really want it. Was it um, aiming to, for the person who, for, for the childless person, people or were you also aiming for the whole community of people who of simply women who were wondering well where does this desire to have a baby comes from yeah I mean absolutely certainly our core audience are people who don't want children and who are very happy to have the sort of support and validation and all of that but but for me, it's a much, much bigger conversation. It's a conversation for anybody who's ever um, thought about whether they wanted children or not, felt pressure in a certain way, and hasn't had a chance to sit and think about it because it's such an assumption of something we're gonna do. Motherhood has increased in value yet again. It's almost fetishized in our society. This is the real solution to climate change, babies. There's one, specifically one woman in the film who really wanted children and couldn't have them. And sort of how she sorted out the rest of her life when she knew that that wasn't going to happen, you know? And my mother of course is in it. And there are some other people who are, um, who became parents. Um, I, I think that this is a film about reproductive freedom it's about bodily autonomy. It's about um, having the space and support to think about what you want your life to look like and what that might mean for you. Reproductive justice was also a term I had never heard of. So here is what I found. Now it is a universal theory that applies to everyone. 
because the three tenets of reproductive justice are quite simple. Loretta Ross was among the 12 women who coined the term of reproductive justice in 1994. She was part of a group called Women of African Descent for Reproductive Justice. Everybody has the human right to decide if and when they will get pregnant. And so the right not to have a child means that we support the right to abortion or birth control or abstinence, if you can hold on. But similarly, because this theory was created by Black women, we fight for the right just as strongly for the right to have the children that we want to have, because we're always subjected to strategies of population control. Our wounds and our children are blamed for everything from the environmental crisis to the mortgage crisis, to crime, to bad schools. Oh, I think we were blamed for Trump having a fake hairdo. I mean, we were blamed for everything. At that time, they published an op-ed in the Washington Post to speak up against their exclusion from the women's rights movement, which had been historically framed by the interest of middle-class women or white, wealthy, white women. Two times white, I don't know why, but white enough. So every era of humanity has tried to control which bodies matter, which bodies should be encouraged to reproduce, which bodies should be discouraged from reproducing. Um, and so reproductive justice points that out. I put the link of that interview in the description because um, everything Loretta Ross says is highly fascinating. So I really uh, recommend you to lose yourself in her talks and everything. Um, anyway, back to theories. So for me, it's a, it's a much broader topic than just here, here are these women who don't want children, stop being so mean to them. You know, it's we live in a world that reinforces this idea over and over and over again. And if you don't fully buy into it, there's something wrong with you. And if you do buy into it and you're unhappy about it, there's something even worse wrong with you. Never question my African identity because I'm child free. You can be an aunt or an uncle to your friend's children and you'll be fine. In fact, you'll be great. Don't forget to take your pill. I won't. I just, I, I support people having children, <laughs> you know, I think, and, um, you know, my sister is a fantastic mother. I'm really glad that my parents have grandchildren um, because they're great grandparents and my nephews love them and everything. So, and, and my sister's always wanted children and, and she and her husband are like wonderful parents. And these are the people, you know, this is like, she knew she wanted it. She knew what she was getting into. I don't think she had this fantasy. <laughs> about it, you know, being perfect and wonderful. People just need the facts. Like they just need to be told the truth and they need the tools to do things on their own time and on their own terms um, and be able to shut out a lot of the noise that is so confusing for all of us. Um, and especially, you know, people are saying, oh, wow, your perfect timing, this whole Roe v. Wade, you know, decision is coming up and wow, you couldn't have timed it better. Roe v. Wade is a Supreme Court decision that enshrined the right to abortion in the American Constitution and it was overturned a few weeks ago. And I'm thinking, we finished this film a year ago. <laughs> like, this was happening a year ago too. You know, it's not like we, like we've somehow made a discovery about how um, very difficult it is for women to actually get the reproductive health care they need and what the implications of that are, you know, and especially for poor women, for black women, indigenous women. I mean, I mean, I'm glad I'm glad the movie came out now because people could sort of attach their thinking to how they were feeling about Roe v. Wade, because um, it's very much a film about reproductive justice. So I'm glad. I'm glad about that, um, but like we've been working on this film for six years, <laughs> so yeah. and that was never something that was a surprise. Like, oh wait, our reproductive uh, autonomy is in danger. Like, yes, it's always it's been, it's been burning. <laughs> it's been in danger for so long. 
it also says that it's not because the right is here that the, the social and society right is, is here as well. That's a very good point. It's true. Even if something is, this is interesting feedback, you know, someone who didn't, you know, who liked the movie, but didn't think it was very important. Like, why are we talking about this? If you don't want children, don't have children. Right. And that's, a, that's a, something I hear a lot from people. Like, what's the problem? Just don't have them, you know? And it's like, that's the problem. Like, that's not what the world is. Um, and just because we have, just because we have birth control pills, you know, doesn't mean that we're free to make all of these choices. And um, just because abortion happens to be legal in, you know, where I live in New York City, uh, doesn't mean that every single person who gets pregnant wants to be and wants to have a child. I mean, and also just because it's legal doesn't mean it's accessible. It doesn't mean that it is affordable. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's safe, you know, the options. Um, I think part of the panic now is that like middle-class white women have now suddenly felt it um, because everyone else has been dealing with this, you know for a long time. At some point, Therese asked me a question. Did you feel it when you were in Paris? Were you aware of the level of pressure when you were there? Yeah. Well, I was aware, but I, I felt, and that's part of the what my feminism, feminist readings were about. It's like, I could feel there was something wrong. And I thought, but I'm feeling well, uh, whether it is being single, whether it is not wanting to um, dress in a sexy way or not wanting to put some makeup on although I, I, I mm -hmm. like it but all of those feminine woman codes I felt like I don't feel free but I couldn't explain why or where it came from and I think that's exactly what you said when you said it, it I feel it's been written for me it's like you know we we're all going through this for the beginning from the beginning of our lives and fi finally someone is going to put it put it into words and you're like Oh, that's actually, I wasn't crazy all the way. I mean, there is something. Well, when I said that, I did realize that I did feel a social pressure growing up in France about being a mom. But it wasn't even like obvious. It was very implicit in terms of, I never realized, I never considered not being a mom as an option. It was just obvious that at some point I would become a mom. The only role that was offered to me was being a mom. I would at some point make babies. I never questioned it. And that's a form of social pressure. So where does that come from? Our societies worldwide live under demographic policies. Demographic policies are population policies in themselves. Our whole concept, because it's government, deciding people are making more uh, enough babies or not enough babies and deciding to regulate it while using uh, implicit or explicit measures. Those policies can be antinatalist or uh, pronatalist. And one example of a very, very famous, you might know it, a very famous antinatalist policy is China. As you look around this town, you simply don't see anyone with more than one child. The one child policy in China was a policy that happened in the 80s. The Chinese government decided people were making way too much babies, so they tried to kindly support people in making less babies. So they legalized birth, um, birth pill and they introduced a family planning, but it didn't work because Chinese people wanted to make babies anyway. So they, try, they began to be like a little bit um, mean and they started to do forced sterilization, forced abortions and uh, fines regarding if you had more than, uh, than one, one, ch one child, you would have uh, to pay something at some point. Dans ma chambre, dans ma chambre.
，但是到还没来，还没来了过去做这思想工作嘛，要过来应采嘞。Okay, I'm、um, I'm editing this video now, and I had not watched the documentary when I filmed it.、Um, but can we just stop and reflect on how insane this government was? How painful it must have been for those women. It's just, I don't even understand how we can call that family planning the same family planning we have in Western countries. Is it's it's just, I don't know. I had to add this because it's just crazy. And wait for the the end. The conclusion is priceless. It is harsh, but is there an alternative? Plenty. Plenty. What the? When Ferris said that, just getting、um, getting money from the government every time you have a child,、um, which I grew up in Canada, which was standard, and I know in France also that's a big part of、sure. um, government support. And I thought, oh, that's pronatalism. That's like you get money to to help you when you have a child. Getting allowance when we have children is one of the way a government can kindly suggest people to make more babies. In France. I realized is a case study in that regard. Pronatalism in France in the 80s. That part is going to be hard because I am going to use a study called France Needs Children that has been done by a researcher. I don't know her name, but I will put everything in the description.、Um, And it made me realize I was probably an unwanted child or the result of a pronatalist propaganda. But anyways. So France needs children is also the name is like first and foremost the name of a propaganda campaign, an advertiser campaign in the streets in 1985, 1985,、um, where we would see huge baby faces under a statement like "Do it look like a governmental issue、um, measure?" Or there is more to life than sex for this one. In 1939, France was trying to increase the fertility rate and brought the family funds under state control. After that, war happened. After the war, people were on fire, so we had a baby boom. In 1969, contraceptives became legal. In 75, abortion too, and in the 70s as well, women massively entered the labor force. So obviously, in the 70s, fertility declined well below the replacement level. Of 2.1 children per woman. What we call the replacement level is the amount of babies we would need to be sure that when the older generation stops working and dies, there will be other human beings to get the system going. So between the 70s and 80s, we had a strong pronatalist revival. In 1984, we had a whole new set of family policies: the young child allowance and the parenting allowance. The study explains that at the time, pronatalism was such a powerful ideology. The feminist movement saw an opportunity to use demographic danger and the glorification of motherhood to gain women's rights. But even though those policies had been useful for a lot of women and it helped them, it has nurtured the traditional family form and the role of women as mothers and homemakers. Prenatalism and women's rights, fake friends. The study reads: In France, mothers compared to women of other Western European countries are benefiting from lengthy maternity leaves, family allowance, and benefits for for those who wished to remain home with children while retaining the right to participate in the paid labor force. At the junction of what women are claiming for and what pronatalism is、uh, standing standing for, there are those policies which is support with whether it is financial or not. For women with children, which is a good thing, the parental allowance in France、um, was not gendered. But in 1993, 95% of the person who who collected it were women. Why would anyone complain about having those rights? Well, when you think about it, why would a mum go to work if she can stay at home and earn a stipend for stay-at-home mothers, especially when she spends? All her income in daycare and babysittings. So many women in France had to stay at home, especially middle-class women or low-class、uh, women, and they were told that there is no, there was no point of going out and working when they can benefit from the parental allowance. And that's something that happens a lot. There is no benefit of going to work except 
freedom, uh, financial independence and self-realization. So we just like mathematically, it's just not useful for them to be out. Especially if you add to that, that even now the wages are still not equal between men and women. So at the time they just entered the labor force, so they were the one with the lowest um, wage uh, income. So mathematically, there was no point of telling the woman, well, you can go and work outside while the men will stay at home. Obviously, it was more interesting to have the one who would earn the, the more money to go to work, to keep working, and the one who earned the less money to stop working for both of them to stop pe uh, spending a lot of money in daycare or babysitting. It's a bit bitter to think about it because it's like we give you some rights but it's a kind of a trap, we make you think you're winning but it's some, in some way we just had the opportunity for you to stay at home, work, for the home to be well, for the family to get going, to the family institution to get going. While us men are enjoying life outside and keep working and earn money. So, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this. Before abortion was legalized in French, Simone Veil, uh, the one who pushed the um, abortion at the parliament, made a very fa famous speech that is still historically, like it's a strong historical uh, speech in France, where she defends abortion. Je le dis avec toute ma conviction, l'avortement doit rester l'exception l'ultime recours pour des situations sans issue. And the big debate at the time, when I said in the 70s, were fertility rate, because nobody understood why we were not making any babies anymore. And so she starts by breaking the link between abortion and fertility rate. So she says in other countries in Europe, we are noticing that it's not because they, are, they have legalized abortion that their fertility rates, fertility rates dropped. Um, and, and she keeps going and she keeps defending abortion and it's quite disturbing because she manages to have a very, like, to be very in favor of abortion, she's defending it, while also having very conservative pronotized statements, uh, namely um, about motherhood and about the fact that a woman accomplishes herself um, in motherhood and everything. Je voudrais tout d'abord vous faire partager une conviction de femme. Je m'excuse de le faire devant cette assemblée presque exclusivement composée d'hommes. Aucune femme ne recourt de gaieté de cœur à l'avortement. Il suffit d'écouter les femmes. C'est toujours un drame. C'est toujours un drame. Cela restera toujours un drame. And actually, a lot of members of parliament voted for abortion under the only condition that we would pass a lot of prenatalist policy right after that. And that's what happened. Right after the abortion was legalized, we, have, we had some new prenatalist measures. And um, I think that's a great example of when you can have an antinatalist policy what it would be said to be an anti natalist policy, which is abortion in this case, but the state of mind and the mentality in the country is still quite conservative on this point. So you gain a right, a legal right, but you didn't gain a social right. And so the mentality is still quite backward. I'm not saying at all that single mom allowances and parents allowances are a bad thing. Um, it's, it's necessary, it has to be handled. The only thing I'm saying is that our rights are not acquired because none of those policies have been passed with the strong willingness and the genuine willingness to help the women's cause. At most, it's motherism of, or momism, I don't know how they call it, but it's not women's rights. Women's rights would require us to admit that women have less right in the society than men and to act consequently. Here, we value, the, we value the situation of the mother, so it makes the mother being an interesting situation to be in. And that's why, coming from an underprivileged situation, which is being a woman in this society, you might, aspi you might aspire to be a mother because it's a more valuable situation in the society. So you aspire to it for the privilege and not for the strong willingness, which is, which is something very personal 
and that belongs to any of us, to every one of us. You don't do it because I lost my, um, I lost track in my sentence, but you do it because you, because of the privilege you can obtain while becoming a mother, but not because of the strong willingness and the strong will and desire to have a baby. So that's it for this first video. It was supposed to be a 50 minutes video, but I decided to break, break it into sections because it's a really, really interesting topic. And the more I search and the more I find some interesting things. So I don't know how long it's gonna last, but I have a few different things to share. Uh, I will share more, so make sure you have updates. And um, yeah, the next one will be about eugenics and will be about the fact that when, when uh, Western countries were developing prenatalists in their countries in the North, they were also developing antinatalist um, policies in the South. And then we'll uh, keep the discussion with Ferris going, so we'll talk about the influence on, of uh, pop culture, of mainstream media and everything. Well, anyway, a lot, a lot to, uh, to discuss. So I hope you enjoyed this one and uh, see you next time. Um, I'm Juliette Silver.